Hey friends, today's episode is brought to you by the folks over at Hungry Root. Hungry Root is the world's first tech-enabled grocery store, and they specialize in delivering customized boxes of delicious, nutritious food right to your doorstep. When you sign up, Hungry Root asks you to fill out a short survey detailing your lifestyle, tastes, and dietary needs. You're then asked if you have any diet goals. They might involve reducing costs, trying new recipes, or a transition to a vegetarian diet. Once the survey is complete, Hungry Root compares your profile with other users with similar tastes, and this is how they can tailor deliveries to your own specific needs. You can always make last-minute edits to your orders, but Hungry Root prides themselves on anticipating your needs with simple recipes that take as little as 10 minutes to make. Then, the longer you subscribe to Hungry Root, the more they'll get to know your tastes and requirements, meaning that each package gets better and better every single time. Personally, I was amazed at how vast the selection is, as Hungry Root has over 2,000 different recipes to offer. I'm always on the lookout for exciting new things to eat, and Hungry Root has helped me discover a bunch of new favorites. We'll put it this way, they have like 18 different kinds of tacos on offer, and they all look incredible. To help save on your first order, Hungry Root is giving the first 100 people who use the code Let's Read 40 40% off their first package, meaning you can start your new dietary journey for less. So click the link in the description or go to HungryRoot.com and use code Let's Read 40 to get 40% off your first order. This is an old story, so I'm sorry if I don't have every detail and exact context. I was about six years old in an old Catholic school, the strict traditional kind. Mandatory uniform, prayers in the morning, all that good stuff. The teachers often doubled as priests, and they were all pretty strict. It was a good time, though. We had a lot of extra activities outside the school. My favorite was one of the nurses of the school because she was particularly kind to me. Compared to those stuck-up priests, she was a breath of fresh air. My friends often teased me about her being my girlfriend, and I couldn't lie and say that she had never traversed my mind. She was only working part-time there, so I would be excited whenever she'd be there. I'd often pretend to be sick just to be with her, and she didn't seem to mind. She would often ask me about my life, my parents, and other random things. One day, as I was helping her to move cleaning supplies after school, she told me to bring her a broom and bucket that was located in the schoolyard bathrooms on the complete other side of the school. Of course, I obliged and went to the location, jumping around. After I get to it, I scan the room and see nothing. I deduce that it must be in one of the stalls. As I approach the stall, I hear the bathroom door slam shut and lock. I try to force it open, but it's impossible. I can't even climb and see out the little windows. I decide to wait for the nurse that was surely going to come back to open it, right? But nothing. After a while, I accept my fate and I think that I'm just going to sleep there overnight. And after a while, I suddenly hear the key going inside the door. And when it opens, I am faced with one of the head priests. I'm thinking I'm going to get scolded like crazy, but I'm very surprised to see him kneeling and calmly asking me, You know the secret passage in the fence back there? I've seen you go through it before, it's okay. I want you to run to it and go back to your home, alright? I just nod and start running. I'm a little shocked, but I don't question it. I squeeze myself in the little gap in the fence and run home, and the next day I notice the head priest paying close attention to me but never mentioning what had actually happened. Another thing is that after this day I never saw that nurse again, which was explained as her moving to another department. One thing also changed in that we now had two young priests transferred to the school that acted as security with frequent police checkups added to it and it was only until way later that I learned that the nurse was involved in some kind of child trafficking ring and that I would have been one of her victims, if not for my guardian angel. I got a story from northern Russia. It was during the mid-90s, I lived in a small town that was slowly dying out as the backbone factory fell apart along with the USSR. 
We used to have our little urchin street gang. Most of the parents couldn't care less about their kids and some of us didn't even have a place to sleep. We used to squat in an abandoned house and used it as our base as well. We never got into the real heavy criminal stuff, just some petty stealing from the markets and brawls with other groups of stray kids. The conditions were extremely poor, but I still remember those times fondly. We had one kid named Pasha that used to live in the same apartment block as some of us and just next door to me. He was the youngest of the group, and though he wasn't that useful as a brawler, as he was weak and malnourished, he was always weirdly funny and optimistic and cheered us up. We took him under our wing, and he kind of became the group mascot after a bit. He was an adopted child, and his mother was an old woman considered to be the number one booze hag on the block. We unironically thought that she was some kind of mad witch, always ragged with dirt on her face, mumbling some nonsense, and of course, an intense stench of booze stuck to her. She was jobless and had no relatives or friends except for Pasha, and it was clear that she was abusing the kid. All of us knew it. We could see the bruises on him, and he didn't like to talk about that, so we did our best to not even bring it up near him. Also, I must say, the situation for everybody was so bad that everything could be brushed off as a simple could be worse. Since our rooms had a common wall joining us together, we used to have a little code. He would knock on the wall three times, and I would answer him with a single knock as to tell him I heard him and everything is good. It was supposed to reassure him if he got scared of the dark, but I knew deep down his main fear was his crazy mother. One day he didn't come up to our base, but kept doing the code knocks on the wall at night. He didn't come for a few days, and even though I'm getting concerned, I still received the code for a few nights. I was too uncomfortable to go see him because of that witch, and I guess my friends thought the same, so we kind of never really discussed it. The next night I don't hear the code. I try to knock in all kinds of different patterns, but no answers. He's probably asleep, I thought. The next day, I decided to get it together and knock at his door. No one answered, but I'm pretty sure someone was there since you could see those old spy holes turn dark when someone watched. Another thing was that faint smell that I only recalled later on, which reminded me of the meat department at the local market. There was definitely something rotting in there, but that wasn't really surprising coming from a drunkard's flat. A week later, you can smell a horrible stench from the hallway. My dad gets to reasoning and calls the cops to break in since the old hag wasn't answering the door. By the end of the day, when we came back home, we see an improvised ambulance with some canvas roll attached to the roof and a few cop cars near the porch. We soon learn that the wrap in that canvas was Pasha's corpse. Rumor was that she stabbed him multiple times and left him for dead. She left town and was never found as far as I know. I still think about those last knocks on the wall, and I wonder if it was him trying to call for help, or maybe it was his mother who was the one knocking. When I was younger, I was home alone chilling, and my parents were out and my older brother that was supposed to be looking after me went away with his friends. Not that I'm complaining. I love to have the house and the console to myself, plus I could use it on the big TV, and that was a pretty big thrill back then. I finished setting up, and I'm like a king on the big couch with a big bowl of Cheetos at my side. Suddenly I hear a knock at the door. I jumped up thinking that it was my parents, but thinking about it, I didn't hear the car and they have the keys anyways. It's probably my brother who forgot something I initially thought. I open the door and I'm startled as I see this guy standing completely still, eyes straight ahead. As I'm typing, I'm trying to find the words to describe his face, but he's just completely bland. No defining features that I can come up with. The type of guy that you wouldn't remember even if you had a conversation with them for more than a minute. I'm standing at the door dumbfounded and after a bit, I snap out of it and ask him what does he want, which he answers, can I come inside? in a deadpan, monotone voice. Nothing else. Everything I ask him is answered with the same phrase. What are you doing? Can I come inside? Are, are you one of the neighbors, or... Can I come inside? Who are you? 
can I come inside? No inflection in his voice, no movement from him, he's just staring blankly in front of him. Eventually I say that if he doesn't talk or look at me that I'm going to call the cops because he's being really weird. I tell him to quit it if it's some kind of sick joke, to which he just answers, Can I come inside? I shut the door and loudly pretend to call the police to scare him away. I can still see his silhouette through the frosted glass that he's still standing there. I'm starting to get actually spooked now, so even if I risk getting my brother scolded, I decide to call the cops for real this time. I describe the situation and they tell me to hide somewhere while they arrive in case he decides to break in. Now before hiding, I quickly snap a few pictures of the glass for proof and go hiding in the storage room shaking in my boots. And after the longest 15 minutes of my life, I finally hear them pull up. So I peek out of the storage door and I see the red and blue lights indicating to me that it's safe to go and see what's actually going on. The creepy guy has finally left, so I just end up opening and giving a statement to the officers. Even though I showed them the pictures, they really didn't seem too convinced. It's just a shadow of a man standing at the front door. I should have taken a picture of him, or better yet, I should have filmed it. After my big brother finally came back, I ended up spending the night completely freaked out. Now that I'm looking back at it, it's even creepier. Nobody takes this story seriously, and the only thing I have to prove it is those photos. This one is from my time in the Scouts. I was 18 at the time, and me and another Scout of my age took a bunch of 8-9 to nine year old Scouts for a two night camping trip on a small mountain. The trail was pretty easy but unpopular, it was a backwooded area with almost no traffic. On the first day of the hike we end up seeing no one. As it's getting late we decide to make camp. The place we decided on was pretty far up the trail but had a clear line of sight downwards in the direction we came from. We light up a fire and make a great feast of s'mores and sausage. After a bit everyone goes to sleep, except for me of course. Feeling kind of adventurous, I decide to set up a hammock a little bit away from the tents to read a book under the stars. At 10.30, I decide to call it a night, and I turn off my little pocket lamp. After my eyes get adjusted to the darkness, I start noticing the silhouette of a man coming up from the trail. He's not using a light, and I don't know why I got a pretty bad feeling about it almost immediately. I observe him as he walks up the trail, and when he notices the camp... He just backs up slowly a few steps so as not to get in direct sight of us and stands there staring at the tents. Obviously he hasn't noticed me and I keep watching him standing there for about 10 minutes. After that, he starts backing away into the trees, takes off his pack and sits in a crouched position still staring at our camp, almost like a beast stalking a prey. I'm staring at him wide-eyed, ready to scream and alert the scouts if he moves too close and this sort of standoff goes until about 3 a.m. when he finally gets up. I'm completely tensed up and I see him now just standing up and staring at the tents like at the beginning. After a few minutes, he finally turns around and walks back down the trail where he came from in a very meticulous way as to not make any sound. I let out a sigh of relief but stay perched on my hammock, keeping watch until sunrise. In the morning, I told the older scout about what happened, and without asking anything else, we just decided that it was time to head back. I still wonder what this guy was doing, just stalking us for hours. I've been working in an ambulance for a few years. These last five months, I've been in the beach town on the west coast. Now the pay is really good and the spot is beautiful so I'm not complaining but most of the calls are just nonsense. The two main categories are rich old dudes from the cliffs crashing their luxury cars or having cocaine and ladies of the night induced heart attacks. The other is harbor junkies and homeless people overdosing on heroin or whatever new drug is on the market at the moment. A lot of deaths sure but everything is pretty explainable and kind of expected. We're trained to understand the mechanisms of injury, a system made to anticipate injuries not readily visible. 
but this one, I still have no idea what could have happened. We got a call and get dispatched to an unresponsive mail at 6am. We're barely awake from a busy full moon night cleaning up degenerates and my partner and I drag ourselves onto the beach. Now generally, bodies that are found in the morning have been there for hours, which means it's pretty much over anyways. As we pull up, we see a little crowd of morning joggers, probably the ones that called. We sigh as we know we have to do all the little routines for appearances when we know there's no way in God's green earth that he could be resuscitated. We ask the crowd to clear and start the CPR. We roll up the body that was face down in the sand. He was clothed with shoes missing, and the first thing I notice is the skin. It's really cold, especially compared to the temperature around there. He's also extremely pale and a little wet, but the clothes weren't, so it wasn't drowning, that we know. I start the first compression and it comes soft, generally good compressions on an unconscious person breaks ribs, but it seemed every rib in this guy's chest was already shattered. At the third compression, I can almost feel his heart in the palm of my hands, but kept pushing out of habit. As I kept doing the compressions, I start noticing his arms and collarbones are fractured as well. Now I haven't even looked properly at his face since I rolled him, since I don't like looking at dead people's faces no matter what, but I jumped up when I did. It seemed every bone in his face was broken as well, even his eyes seemed sunken into his broken orbit, and I've never seen anything like that. Without paying attention it just looked like he's skinny, but it was quite horrifying when you look at it up close. The strangest part was there wasn't a drop of blood anywhere around. I looked at my partner who had been watching me in shock since I started the CPR and we just decided to call it right then and there. All I know is that the sheriff coroners got involved but still I have no idea what could have caused those kinds of injuries to a human being. I was 15 years old living in a pretty quiet suburb. I used to spend most of my time in my best friend's house since he was kind of spoiled and had every game that ever existed and chill parents that would let him geek however he wanted. The quickest way to his home was through this giant drain channel, going a little below ground and cutting through the neighborhood, very convenient to say the least. One night after hanging out with my best mates I decided to go back home at about 1.30am since I had to help my dad with some renovation work the next day. Now usually I try to avoid going through the drain at night because there are zero lights and it's simply incredibly creepy to be honest. After hesitating for a bit I decided that I'd still rather go through it than go the long way. I used my phone light for guidance and stepped down into it. The only sound that I could hear is the noise from my footsteps and I can only see a little cone of light produced by my phone as I'm advancing through while hugging the embankment. About halfway through it, I started hearing some muffled sounds coming from the darkness. Initially, it sounds like a little child or a small animal sobbing, and I'm kind of creeped out, but as I'm advancing, I realize that it's clearly an adult putting on a child's voice. I feel a chill up my spine, and my heartbeat is now completely off the charts. I decided to quickly turn the light in the direction of the sound directly on my right. I only saw it for a second, but the image is still burned into my brain. A grown man squatting at the top of the embankment, really fat and hairy. He had very long hair and was wearing a full pink bra and miniskirt with pink socks to match this grotesque outfit. The second I put my light on him we make eye contact and I can see his face is also smeared with makeup with mascara dripping down his eyes. I didn't even think and just start bolting through the exit and I swear that I could see him standing up as I turned my light away. Also, the sobbing had completely and suddenly ceased. This was the fastest I had ever run, and I kept at it a little bit around the block until I was sure that I wasn't being followed. Needless to say, I never walked through that drain again at night. I was working in a museum. The building was gigantic with four floors, three basements and was planned to be expanded even further. As part of an October event we did an overnight stay with some students. 
The teens involved were mostly honor students, so we didn't expect any weird stuff besides your typical teenage hormones. The group activity was supposed to be some spooky themed laser tag in the safe zones and watching some horror kinos on the big projector at midnight. After eating a bunch of pizza and some stories, every teenager fell asleep in a room on the third floor. If you ignore the mummy and a gigantic whale skull on the ceiling, it's a pretty comfy place to sleep in, I reckon. And the night was fine, until about 3am. Me and the other supervisors start to hear heavy footsteps coming from outside the room. Now the building acoustics can be pretty wild, but these were really close. The doors were closed, and after a quick head count, I'm reassured to see all the teens are there sleeping. We debated going out, and after a bit I decided to grab one of those heavy duty flashlights and go investigate since we'd be held responsible if another kid snuck in with the others. As I went down to the second floor and inspected the area, I see everything was how it was supposed to be except for this section with oversized wooden blocks. They were supposed to be neatly stacked but now they were randomly scattered on the floor. Probably one of the teens earlier had knocked it over during the tag game. I'm feeling glad that I caught it before my boss and so I start stacking them back up. Suddenly, I'm startled by my walkie-talkie turning on. It was the other supervisor and she sounded kind of frantic. She told me that she needed me back on the third floor in the corridor between the sleeping room and the bathroom. I climbed back up and found her frantic, looking quite pale. The corridor was near a kid's section with all sorts of toys and make-believe objects like puppets, a playhouse and such. There was a toddler wagon in the middle of the hallway, filled to the brim with toys. We were both puzzled and surprisingly enough, she's the one to come up with a rationalization for it. Maybe it just rolled out since the floor is slightly slanted. I don't know. I look at her and nod. Yeah, that must be it. Even though that wouldn't explain the stepping noises, it's better not to freak her out more than that, so that's case closed for now. We consider taking a camera from the storage room and setting it up, but after a bit, we both agree against it. The night was already too weird and we just had to survive until 10am for when the event was finished. We opted to take shifts and the night was pretty fine except for some complaints from the teens that there was some kind of noise that kept waking them up. Me and the other supervisor didn't hear anything though and we wrapped this little sleepover as a success. After the event ended, still kind of freaked out, I decided to do my little investigation and ask around for weird stories. The place had no official history with ghosts, but one of the buildings that was merged into it was a lab of some sort. Back in the day, the place had a pretty catastrophic tuberculosis outbreak, causing it to be abandoned for a while before getting bought and turned into a museum. Also. There was no supernatural stuff, but one of my seniors made me aware of the third basement that most of the employees avoided for some reason. This part of the building was housing the antique medical equipment that couldn't be put on display, and my jaw drops as he describes the stuff that's in there. I hadn't had the gut to go by myself, but I gag every time I think that there were pickled children just three stories below the room that I spent the night in. Alright, so I don't want to be specific about the location, but this happened around Pennsylvania. Most I'll say is that I don't live close enough to any metropolitan area worth noting, thus my drives are long, lonely, and even smelly. I was doing Chinese food deliveries, and to be frank, I was getting sick of it. I can't even eat Chinese anymore. The smell of the food has become so embedded in my nose and brain that I can't even bring myself to put the food in my mouth without gagging. I was rolling up to the restaurant for the next pickup of the night. I'm surprised as the bagging lady kept handing me bags, over ten of them. Jesus Christ. Busy night, I guess. Lots of orders? She shakes her head. Nope. Only one guy. As she hands me the ticket, I see the bill is massive, floating around $500. I'm looking at the address, and even though it's pretty far away... I'm kind of excited because generally those kinds of massive orders means one heck of a tip. I begin driving and taking in the details just in case this dude orders again in the future. The place is completely remote and I can see the key road features disappearing as I go further along. 
First, the sidewalk stopped running alongside the roads. After that, the street lamps, then the white lines on the ground, and soon after, I start hitting random gravel beds. I thought to myself that this better be worth it and pray that I don't snap my axle or something else. I arrive at the address, and it's literally just a stop in the road in the middle of nowhere. No driveway, no signs, not even a mailbox. Thinking my GPS was bugged out, I decide to call the guy to clarify the address. Of course, no answer. I'm starting to think that I got lured into the middle of Hick Woods just to get murdered, and as I was starting to dial the restaurant to confirm the address, I see another car oncoming with its headlights shining on me. I'm like a gazelle frozen in fear. I see the car slowing down near me, accepting my end, dead from a drive-by shooting I was thinking. The car stops right next to me and slowly rolls down its window. My tension goes down as I realize that he's just a pizza delivery driver. He asked me if this is the place and I realized that we couldn't have both had GPS mess-ups at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, this is the place. They ordered pizza? Yeah, huge order too. He seemed really excited for the same reason as me initially. I don't even have time to say anything else, and another figure comes out from the bush. He's holding a flashlight, but isn't pointing it at anything, just a little off to the side. And he stutters, Hey, hey guys, f food? Something is really uncanny about him, and I felt even more uncomfortable than a minute before when I thought that I would get got by a drive-by. He's standing in a painfully bad posture, like visible scoliosis that you could identify at a glance. He snaps the flashlight directly at my face, blinding me and says, Th Thank you for arri arriving f first. He snaps the light to the other driver's face, and now with a clear voice he says, You lose. The other driver and I look at each other with a mix of fear and perplexion. I decide to get out of the car and start unpacking the bags, which wasn't the best move in hindsight. He snaps the light to a spot on the road. Here, p -p please. He keeps alternating between lighting the spot and the other driver's face. What's your problem, man? He shouts while covering his eyes. I can tell the tension was rising, and though I'm not enjoying this, I feel the best course of action is to finish the delivery and just get away from here. When my stuff is completely unpacked, I try to assist my pizza bro, but the creep blinds me with the lights and hisses, Don't help! In a clear voice again. I hold my hands up and go back to my car, waiting for the delivery guy to finish, as I decide to not leave him alone with this guy. During this downtime, I finally get a good look at him. The guy is actually way taller than his awful posture made him look, at least over six feet. I'm rattled as this delivery guy kept dropping the pizzas on the road, cussing under his breath. I start texting my boss on the verge of a panic attack, telling him I'm taking the night off after this one. As I lift my head from the phone and look back at them, I can see the delivery guy staring at me with wide eyes. He moves his head in a way as if to say, look behind you, and I jump as I see the gangly dude right next to my driver's window. He points down and says sharply, Window! Too terrified to even contest it, I oblige, and he slips in a bunch of bills through the window before it has even finished opening. Then what I saw next I'll never forget. The guy stood up straight and jumped over my car. I could hear two distinct thuds on my roof. I saw the pizza guy bolting away, and before he could even open his door, I saw the lanky guy catching up to him. The most uncanny run I had ever seen, I could only describe it as running a beanbag race without the beanbag. My head went blank and before I could see him catch him, I floor it and just get out of there. And for 15 minutes I drive with adrenaline pumping through my veins expecting the guy to be on the road behind, running after me every time I look in the rearview mirror. I don't even go back to the restaurant and decide to head straight up home. I down half a handle of whiskey and I just knocked myself out. For a while, I was too nervous to go on deliveries or anywhere for that matter. I even had a dream about this creep. 
There has been a missing person case for the pizza delivery guy and they concluded that his car had skidded off the road since it was found wrapped around a tree. No sign of him though. The picture showed a destroyed vehicle and thousands of dollars worth of food on the ground, completely torn apart. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. I was in a little bar in Canada. I was getting drunk, chaining beers, and ended up chatting with an American Marine. We banter for a bit and become total bros almost instantly, and we spend the night trying to pick up girls acting like complete fools and joking around. When it's closing time, we find out that we're stationed at the same hotel, which is not a really big coincidence since it's the closest one. We wobble to it, still cracking up and singing in the streets like lunatics, and after we finally arrive, we exchange phone numbers and just before I enter the lobby, the marine stops me. Hey, you want to see something? I get the feeling that he'll whip out his junk if I say anything, but thankfully he reaches into his pocket and gets a weird looking box. He opens it to reveal a medal in the box and I nod in approval. This, this is the medal of honor, bro. I start immediately hyping him up. Bro, I had no idea you were a veteran. I jokingly saluted him and thanked him for his service. Curious, I asked him where he served. He tells me that basically the answer should be Afghanistan, but in truth, he was in special ops somewhere in the Middle East. I asked him where, but he only answers that he can't tell, and after a little back and forth, he changed the subject and asked me, Hey man, you want to hear something really disturbing? Of course, I agree. Nothing better than some crazy war stories. He lights a cigarette and starts telling me the story. Towards the end of his career, his group had the order to attack some terrorist hideout in the middle of nowhere. They went there expecting hell, but strangely there was almost no resistance. They killed a few people who fired at them, but most of the people there surrendered, almost begging to become prisoners. Something strange is going on now. After interviewing a prisoner, they get the tip to walk about two miles east. The only thing they could get out of him, even with the advanced interviewing technique, he told me with a little grin on his face. The squad split up and four soldiers went to check out on the tip. After about two miles as promised, they found a big tarpaulin spread on the ground. After lifting it up, they discovered a really big hole under it which was filled with grey, disgusting, rotten bodies and decided to quickly get away from there. At that point, I tried to be the comic relief and asked him if anybody soiled their pants. And his exact words were, Nah man, we're hardcore spec ops, corpses don't scare us. What made us leave was that they were still moving, man. He tells me they brought a few more guys with them and a video camera for documentation purposes. They lifted the tarpaulin again and took footage of the bodies squirming in the hole. A quick body count got about ten grey bodies slowly crawling in the hole, seemingly trying to get out. He told me that suddenly he felt something on his boot. One of them had grabbed him, and without even thinking he pulled out his knife and cut it. I asked him again if he about soiled himself with what just happened but he just shook his head special ops are hardcore man I tell you after that event they all had to report to some superior authority they all got interrogated and of course the video camera got confiscated none of their questions got answered and nobody must tell anything to anyone in return they would get a medal of honor and all the privileges that go with it to which they agreed after these pretty outlandish stories, he smiles and asks me if I want to see something even more awesome. He tells me to open the box and lift the metal and the stuffing under it. I'm not sure what it is, but when I realize, I almost puke on the spot. It was a wretched, disgusting grey finger. I could swear that I saw it bend a little bit. He almost cries laughing at my reaction. Yeah, bro, I wasn't kidding. I'm still thinking it's just some elaborate twisted joke and he just shrugs. Well, now you can tell the story too. Eventually, we say goodbye and go to our rooms. 
The next morning I see him in the lobby and we shake hands and he promises to offer me a beer next time. Next week I tried to call him but apparently his phone number wasn't real and I never had a chance to contact him ever again and I haven't heard from him since. When I was a kid, around 12, I was calling my dad Crazy Old Man as part of a game, a pretty inoffensive joke and we were used to teasing each other so that didn't feel disrespectful to me at least. One day though, my mom took me aside and told me that I had to stop calling him that. I was surprised because she seemed genuinely concerned about it. Apparently some old girlfriend of his had tried to make him go insane. She didn't give me more details and I assumed that this was more for her comfort than my dad's. That was until I learned the whole story from other family members. About 20 years or so ago, my dad was known as a womanizer. He had his fair share of romances, but one time, he ended up with what everybody described as a crazy witch. And not metaphorically. She was apparently into black magic and curses, way before it was just a trend for Twitter teenagers. Still, they dated for a while and after getting bored of it, he just dumped her without a second thought. The girl went completely crazy and started harassing him relentlessly. She was doing some unhinged stuff like scratching his car and peeing on his door. I guess my dad was pretty unfazed by that, even kind of amused, but one day during a very public fight she told him, You made me crazy, and you'll go crazy for me. After that, she disappeared completely and not a word from her. Until months later, my dad started to get really sick. This was completely out of the ordinary as he was a really healthy and athletic person. Heat stroke, delusions, weakness, his state was getting worse by the day. Everybody was certain that he was going to die and all of the family gathered at his house to watch over him. One day, he just stood up from his bed and walked to the kitchen where most of the family was hanging out. He started asking why was everybody here in an extremely aggressive way which was completely out of character for him. He was ignoring every reasonable answer and just started ramping up in anger. As he was getting louder and almost shouting now and my grandpa and uncles tried to calm him down. Even though he was supposed to be sick and dying a second ago, all of my three uncles were struggling to hold him down. At this point, everybody's getting freaked out and he starts pointing at my grandma, telling her she should fear him while frothing at the mouth. Now my grandma is a very religious woman and she seemed to be completely unfazed by him and she looked him dead in the eyes and said, I can't fear any of my offspring. Just these words seemed to stun my dad and he backed away immediately. He walked aimlessly in the living room, grabbed a sewing machine and then threw it across the room and stormed out of the house. After a few days he came to the house wearing the same clothes, completely oblivious to the crazy fit and his health quickly came back to normal after a little time. Now I don't know what white magic my grandma did to counteract the witch's curse, but I haven't called him crazy since I heard this story. I was out in the forest, camping on a warm summer night. I was pretty familiar with the spot and I never had any incidents there. What added to that sense of security might be that the place looked straight out of a fairy tale book, especially at this time of year. The sky was clear and you could hear the gentle noise of the river with the sun shining on it. This stage made me feel particularly romantical and I decided it was fit for me to spend a night under the stars. I crushed the can of beer that I just finished and pulled my cot out from the tent and gently laid on it. Nothing can compare to the amazingly clear night sky away from the city's pollution. I kept staring at this wonderful starlight show and slowly drifted off into one of the most restful sleeps of my entire life. When I opened my eyes again, I could see the sun had barely started rising. I had rolled onto my side and I couldn't help but feel some tickling sensation in my lower back. No, I'm not a morning person. I would need a little more stimulation to get out of my morning torpor. As I was about to close my eyes again, I feel now something wet brushing against my back. 
Completely freaked and still dazed out, I roll off the cot, yelling, stumbling on my feet as I come face to face with a large, dark figure, huffing and puffing. Still in my morning confusion, I let out an even louder yell and the creature just answered with a deep grunt. In shock, I stare at it frozen as the beast slowly turns its tail and goes back into the forest. As my brain started waking up and settling off from the insane cocktail of adrenaline wrecking my system, I finally realized that this thing was a black bear, an adult black bear. Thankfully, it seems the beast had no other intention than to sneak up to me and taste the sweat off my back and nothing else. Still in shock, I start packing up my stuff and vow that I'll never sleep in the open air again. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST. And there are some super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. You should come join. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, or submit over email. And you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links down below in the description. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, don't buy panties out of vending machines. Buy them from me.